Okay, so coming to our newest big initiative, um, the curriculum mapping. So, once again, we're trying to enhance and extend our ability to, I guess, build what's, what we would consider a next generation learning management system. Um, so going beyond you know, the traditional learning management system, which is quizzes and assessments and things like that, um, and looking at how do we more strategically align school box content with your curriculum, and at the same time solve a range of different problems in your school around um, auditing, um, curriculum management, um, changes to the curriculum, you know, we've just had version 8 to version 9. Um, how do we manage these problems and keep our courses um, up to date with the curriculum and ensure that they are delivering the curriculum at a strategic level? Going back to the original beginning of this initiative, we started out with a partnership with Atlas Rubicon um, and we announced that almost four or five years ago. Um, that didn't eventuate as far as I would like. They had a change of ownership um, uh, shortly after that. Um, and so we went and started to build out our own. Um, so uh, you've probably seen over the last few releases, we've introduced the idea of packages into Schoolbox. Um, and packages are where we um, distribute our curriculum from. Um, those packages have been extended and enhanced. We've added um, most of the state's curriculums. We've added Victoria, New South Wales, WA, um, TASI, um, we've also now added Australian curriculum version 9 as well, into there as well. Um, so all of those curriculums are now packaged and ready to be installed inside the system. In addition to that, we started to work on the problem of how do we know how the curriculum is being used. Um, and so we've begun by um, adding to the curriculum browser references to where the, the curriculum is being referenced. So now when you look at a, an asset inside Schoolbox, and when I say an asset, um, curriculum mapped assets for us are badges, um, activities, um, they are um, um, courses, units, rubrics, um, can all be mapped back to the curriculum. What we're trying to build here is the ability for you to identify how the curriculum is being used, how you're assessing students, um, and we need that mapping. So mapping was the first step of of this process. That's been in place now for quite some time. Next step was adding the ability to see visibility of where you can see that curriculum. Um, and we've improved the mapping process as well with the new browser as well. So you can see up in the top right corner these little flags, as you're browsing through the curriculum you're going to get little indicators to show you how much the curriculum's been used and where it's been used. You'll be able to drill in and see exactly what it's been used for. <coughs> should point out that this, this is only for courses. Um, it won't show mapping within the classroom context. Um, and the reason for that is that we, we wanted to focus in on the course building process and the curriculum mapping of the course building process rather than just classroom teacher use. Because as you know, those classrooms are thrown away each year and archived. Um, so it didn't make sense to be strategic about those things that are short lived. Um, we were strategic about the course development process. Um, so that's where we focused our, our mapping um, work on. Obviously when you pull a course into your classroom, it's going to come with all that mapping information, and so we can still report on how the students have been assessed against the curriculum, but from a planning and, and mapping perspective, we are expecting people to be focused on planning and mapping within the course area. Will it highlight what your teachers aren't necessarily confident? Good question. Right. It doesn't at the moment, but that's our, probably our next problem to solve, um, is to look at a report that shows where you've not got coverage, um, and also at the same time provide some sort of audit report so that you can present that to, to auditors and say, look, here we go, this is, this is your curriculum, here is how we've taught it. These are all the assessments we do, here's all the, the units we cover, these are all the, the things that we do. Which brings me to the next bit of coverage for how we deliver the curriculum. So one of the key things that we're looking at with delivery of curriculum is lessons. So when it comes down to actually delivering um, a curriculum in the classroom, lessons become a key aspect of how we, as teachers, teach the curriculum. So, before we could map to lessons, we needed to build lessons. So we've added the lesson plan feature into your courses. Um, the lesson plan feature has been designed with a range of best practice templates available out of the box. 
So from day one, you'll be able to start creating lessons based on standard um, lesson plan templates. Obviously, as a school, you can um, update, change, alter, create your own lesson plan templates. They can be as complicated or as simple as you like. Um, the thinking behind the templates was ultimately we want to be able to produce a report that will show you for your course. Um, you can imagine that big table where it shows all the lessons and each column is, is one of these fields in your lesson plan template. And so you'll be able to get a holistic view of how you're delivering the course with the curriculum codes mapped, with your learning intentions identified. Um, so that will once again become a really important report for how you've delivered your course and what it looks like. Once we've built these lessons, they can be rolled out to your classroom. Um, and so lessons can be in, uh, included as part of your course input, and they will be rolled out to all of the students in the class. Um, you can choose whether they're visible or not. You can also choose down to a field level, whether the fields are visible or not. So you can have um, your learning intentions visible to the students, but perhaps you have your differentiation or your teacher notes not visible to students. So you've got control over the, at each field level for the lesson plans, what's available to students and they will see you know, the details of that lesson. Obviously, we will be wrapping these lessons against the curriculum. That's a really important part of, of it. Um, so that's why it's part of my curriculum mapping initiative. Um, <coughs> coming in the next release, um, and something we have to leave on the drawing board just because we're releasing now and we always have to get in VP out, but coming in the next release will be the ability to link activities to your lessons. Um, and when I say activities, that'll be due work, quizzes, um, tasks. Um, you'll be able to link those into your lesson. So you can imagine having a lesson, learn to find your learning intentions, your overview, and then at the bottom of that, that um, lesson, you'll have a, a range of different activities for the students to complete um, that you may assess or, or they may self-assess um, themselves as completing that lesson. Um, or a quick exit quiz or something like that to make sure they consume the knowledge. So we do see lesson, um, lessons becoming part of the, the flow of your, your course um, and part of how you deliver your curriculum. Um, for many schools, you've already probably been doing lessons inside Schoolbox. Um, you probably had like text boxes or news posts or, or things like that. Um, that was all great, but what we wanted to do was create a system that allowed you to store these for reuse, um, be able to put them inside a course and import them next year. Um, of course, if you build a lesson and it's a great lesson and you do it in your class page, um, last release we added a feature that allows you to copy that back to the course. So you can now send your lesson plans back to the course as well. So you can save it for next year um, and make it part of that, that material that you use next year as well. One of the things we identified um, with lesson plans and probably a big driver for, for us was um, during sort of COVID, we had a lot of teaching staff that were off. Um, and there was a lot of substitutions, and I'm still sure schools are still dealing with a lot of um, substitutions and relief teachers being brought in. Um, and so lesson plans really allow the school to have a continuity of, of teaching. Um, they establish that, that direction and that backbone. Students can continue to progress with those lessons um, in the absence of their, their teacher, as long as they've all been um, built out and they're ready to go, um, the relief teacher can pick up and run with them um, from day one. It's also great for our schools that are doing distance learning. Um, perhaps the students are remote or on school camp or um, at a different location. Um, the lesson plans allow the students to continue their learning um, without the classroom. Um, it's a great way to sort of have that replaced um, process. Um, and of course, it enables all those great things like flipped learning and things like that as well. So you can put all your lessons up and students can um, access them the night before and, and watch all the videos and engage with the content um, and then come into the class um, ready to go um, the next day. Why don't just jump in there from a substitute perspective as well? It provides an opportunity for the that substitute teachers to then provide feedback on how the class went within that location as well. Not just instructions to them, but sort of closes that feedback loop a little bit. And can I just also jump in the one of the things that we've talked about in a few of the user forums now, and one of the things that the school engagement team often has conversations with schools about is 
when we roll out something like this and schools start to adopt it, um, James talked about the templates and within those templates we've provided what we would call some best practice we've done that through connecting with the educators within our company and people who have been in schools recently and looking at what that looks like from learning intention, success criteria, terminology, but as a school you get the flexibility to make those changes. We strongly encourage you to consider where does that sit in your policy and your planning? Where does it sit in your teaching and learning documents? Um, so that you build that consistency of workflow across your school, but you also have an opportunity if you are going to embed learning intent, learning, uh, sorry, lesson plan, that you've got the ability to build accountability into it from a little perspective <coughs> and a consistent approach within your school so it's not random and everyone's using lots of different language. Um, you know from a student experience perspective, um, you don't want one group walking into one class where they're using learning intention success criteria, they walk into the next class and they use Walt well, Wilf, they walk into the next class and they use something different. We want to enable you guys to be able to have the flexibility to build what is important for you as a school. Yep. And then, of course, it comes through that reporting piece as well, um, is ultimately we'll be building reports off this, this data, and you want your reports to be consistent. You don't want to be coming into executive and everyone's course is um, looking different, um, so you want to have some consistency with that approach across the school. Um, and that's, uh, I think that goes through with all the things that we do at Schoolbox is that we, we focus on collaboration, consistency, making these processes school processes rather than individual teacher processes. Still allowing differentiation down at the, the classroom level, recognising the differentiation is important, but also trying to get some, some, some policy and approach um, to these practices as well. Okay, I think there's a question up the back about summary reporting. Let's have a chat about summary reporting. Um, so, along with curriculum mapping, it becomes obvious that um, Schoolbooks is becoming more and more adept at understanding um, the reporting of the school. Uh, the learning management system now captures a lot of both formative and summative um, information. Um, it's growing in its understanding of the students' um, you know, knowledge. Um, and it's getting better and better at tracking them. Now, re report generation has been a problem in schools for a long time, and there's often been a disconnect between the learning management system and the reports, and often that disconnect results in teacher double handling, um, and teachers having to do double entry into another system, um, and a whole range of other um, awkward processes that we would like to avoid. Now, I don't have the solution to all reporting needs by any means, because as you may be aware, every school has a different approach to reporting. Um, there isn't one um, solution to all the problems. And I've spoken in previous user forums about the fact that we have three different approaches to reporting. Um, we have our sync to the SIS approach. We have our API approach. So um, that's another thing I should mention, that API has become a big um, uh, tool for a lot of schools. But we also have our third approach, which is Schoolbox's ability to um, create a report internally. The ability for us to build a report internally came out in the last release, um, and it allows you to do a report run for a particular cohort um, and extract that into a PDF uh, report for each of the students. It's been designed as a statement sort of report, style report to begin with, so it just gets um, some grades from um, your assessments inside Schoolbox and puts them on a statement report. So that's its, it's very bare bones basic sort of statement report. So as you can see, that doesn't solve all problems in all schools, but it can solve quite a few problems for a lot of schools who just want a very basic statement report. Um, and it solves the problem for schools that say, all of our information is already in Schoolbox and parents have already got it, um, they've already seen it, they don't really need a report except for when they want to take it away with them and go to another school or they want to take it to, with them to go to get a job or to a university. Um, it, it fits into that specific purpose um, where you just need a, a, a basic report for that purpose. For more sophisticated um, uh, reports, the API has become the tool that I would recommend for schools that are looking to build more sophisticated reporting uh, requirements. Um, you can use our API to extract all of the assessment data from Schoolbox. Um, you can get all sorts of things from there. You can get project marks, quiz marks, um, assessment marks. You can get, um, yeah, pretty much everything that's in Schoolbox can now be extracted via that API. So I, I highly recommend if you're, if you're feeling constrained or limited by our 
Um, internal report, that's probably the next step to look at. Um, it gives you much more capabilities. Um, in 23.0, we've added um, the ability to add the box and whisker cohort graph to the um, PDF report. Um, so the PDF report will now include that um, cohort um, box and whisker as well. Um, and we'll continue to add um, bits and pieces to that report um, over the next few releases. Um, badges are probably the one that comes up the most. Um, would make sense to go on there as well. Um, and there's a few other areas I'll talk about later in the roadmap session. Is there any questions about summative reporting? Because I know this is a, always a hot topic. James, where are you surfacing that? Like we, we have our um, reports in the SIS, and they get surfaced on the student profile of all parents. Yep. And with that synchronization, put a little button there. Yep. Um, so we, if we were to use this or partially use this, we would surface. Yeah, so what I would suggest is that this PDF report would still be uploaded into your SIS. Um, so if you're using Synergetic, that would be into to Docman, um, and then it would come back through that same integration as before. It's just a different um, generation step. Um, same you know, storage, same hosting, all the same as what was happening before. It's just generating from Schoolbox. So that you don't have to um, get the data out of Schoolbox and get it into Synergetic, generate in Synergetic, and then upload then put it into Docman. You can just generate it straight from Schoolbox. So you skip a few steps in the process. Um, but ultimately the same end result. Um, I, I think that, yes, in the future we probably will look at self-hosting these as well and make them um, directly downloadable by the, the students and the teachers from our interface at some point. Um, if this becomes sort of popular and the way to go, we'll probably continue to go down that path as well. Because um, it's fine for Synergetic schools, but for schools that don't have Synergetic, they may not have a, a web portal for, for these to be hosted in. So we do have a lot of other customers that need um, hosting and reports as well. Yep, up back. Is there a capability that adds you to comments? Yes. Synergetic has a comment bank, and you can sort of listen to it. Can we do this? Yep, yep. So um, there's a couple of things. A lot of schools have created like a um, they have like a homeroom or a tutor group class within their um, within their school box system, and that's where they typically put the, the comment. Um, and so the, the homeroom teacher would go in and, and write their, their overall comment um, through that class page. That's one way to approach um, that that scenario. Um, so yes, you can put comments in. It will display comments. I, in my example, I don't have comments included. Um, but it is an option to turn on comments and show comments in the report as well. James, can I just clarify the part of the question? I heard the word bank. Um, do, do we have the capacity? I'm pretty sure we don't. To actually generate, <laughs> to generate a comment bank that teachers can select comments from? No. Okay, so just wanted to clarify that just in case. There was a little bit of Yeah. So, further that, we create the bank uh, look, I'm probably going to stay away from banks, to tell you the truth. Um, look, I'm probably more open to the conversation around AI than around banks. Um, uh, and, I, and, and then when you start talking about banks and AI, like you're then asking what is the real value of the comments? Um, why are we doing the comment if it's, if it's coming from a bank and coming from an AI? Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I tend to think, like, what's, what, what, are we, what are we trying to achieve? Um, so I'm, I'm sort of on the fence at the moment, but I'm, I'm looking more at an AI uh, probably solution in the, in the long run. Just what about a course descriptor? Yes, um, course descriptor. Not at the moment on there. Um, uh, we do have it obviously inside Schoolbox, um, but it's not being shown um, on the report. Yeah. 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 This is currently not available in the morning. You have to get the assessment module on it on, is that correct? Yes, I think so, yes. If you're not on the uh, Pro or Elite plans, it's not available. It's on Pro or Elite moment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes? Um, in terms of reporting requirements and kind of um, reporting it in progress to the standards yep. and the curriculum codes, I'm going to talk about that a bit later on today um, in the roadmap session. But yeah, I, I'm well aware that that's a future progression for this, especially within the junior school. Um, at the moment, this doesn't solve the junior school reporting requirements at all. Um, and so, yeah. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that we need to do some changes, and I've got some stuff in the, the later session for that. Is there potential to add attendance percentages of the no. No. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like, once again, I will state that like when you start to mix data up from different systems, um, you're probably looking at going to the API and using the API. So do anyone wants to answer this question? Yeah, so the solution that we've actually done with a few schools is create an assessment item inside your class that is literally a percentage. Um, you just get them to put the percentage on there, it's attendance, throw it on the record. Um, the schools we did it with, it took them about five minutes to their entire class. So that would be the way in which you do it. Double handling back the other way. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I, look, I, I think that if you're starting to mix data sets up and, and your reports are more sophisticated than a statement, you're probably looking at using the API um, to bring data into a central data lake or some sort of data storage and then build a report using crystal reports or something like that on top of it. Um, much more sophisticated use cases. I understand they're out there um, and we're happy to support them. But, um, yeah, that, this report's not designed to solve all those problems by any means. It, it probably never will solve all the, the requirements every school. Any other questions about reports? Yeah. Oh yeah, was there any lesson, lesson planning questions? Is there a unit plan? No, it's a good question. I, we we talked, talked a bit about this, like, I think for a lot of schools they will use it as a unit yeah, like, um, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, we call it lesson planner, and but it could well be used as a unit planner. Um, so yeah, it's up to the school how they apply the concept, whether they use it down to the lesson level or whether they, they just do it down to the unit level. Um, I'd be comfortable with both use cases. I, I don't think it, it excludes either or, um, and that sort of goes back to that scope and sequence um, report as well. Um, and so. We may look at fine tuning that. If, if lots of schools are interested in, in looking at, you know, differentiating between lessons and units, we might look at creating some sort of um, ability to differentiate. But at the moment, it's you could you, de you define what it's used for. Yep. Um, if the lesson plan was to be exported to a classroom, would you still need the classroom teacher edit or tweak that slightly, but it wouldn't be edited on the where it came from? Exactly. Yeah. So as with all sort of the school box. Way, um, you know, we have this idea that once it's copied into the classroom, it becomes property of that teacher in that classroom, and they can differentiate it in any way they see fit, um, unless it's been marked as a common assessment task, which then locks it down. But in terms of lesson plans, we fully expect them to be differentiated and adapted and altered for that particular class. Um, that's that's exactly how we expect it to be to be used, um, and we hope that teachers are putting some differentiation in it, um, and that. And it's an interesting thing to think about in terms of when you're building your course, to what level of detail do you go to in the lesson planning? Um, and to think about, do we just do a high level overview of what we're trying to achieve, and then when it gets to the classroom, the teacher fills in the detail, the videos they want to use, and things like that? Or do we, we go to a bit more detail at the course planning session? Um, so that's an interesting um, thing to think about, is how deep we go, um, and how much differentiation we allow um, down at the, the class level. James, have you any thoughts as a team for thoughts about the difference this will make in the relationship between the class page and the unit page and the lesson plan? Because the lesson plan is going to be on a page and stuff like that. And you know, I've seen this replacing the unit page potentially. Yep. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah if, it, if it gets used like as a unit planner, yeah. it does. Um, um, potentially play, replace the um, unit page. Um, if it, yeah, it, 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 we've also talked about the course outline component um, and the complexity of the course outline component and how we might redo that. Um, we do foresee there's going to be some re-jiggling of where things go and where schools prefer things to sit. Um, and we'll probably follow in the footprints of what schools determine his best practice with that. Um, I, I, we've thought about it, we don't want to think too much about it because I think schools are going to make the decision what works best. Um, ultimately, I do agree that class pages also will probably get a reduced um, focus as well and the focus will go more to lesson pages. 
Um, and so lessons will, will be where a lot of content is hosted, um, you know, videos and, and material and, and documents and things like that will end up in the lessons rather than necessarily in the class page. Um, and that also then opens the question that we've always had about class pages is, well, I lose my class page each year and I want to duplicate it to next year. Well, this gives you the opportunity to not lose it because you've built a, a rich lesson that you can keep next year. Um, and so I think that we'll see a bit of a transition away from course unit lesson pages as being a primary tool um, and these becoming more of the primary content tool. Um, but how, that, how long that takes and what it looks like, I'm, I'm up to being led by the schools on that at the moment. Question? Uh, well, multiple staff be able to edit simultaneous so lesson plans or will it be one at a time only? Yeah, technically you can. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> um, you probably could run into problems because if two people say at exactly the same time, they might override each other's changes. Um, we probably will add drafting um, into lesson plans and what that means is it'll auto-save as you're going and it probably will need to detect whether there's multiple teachers. But generally we find that that's not that big an issue. Um, we have lots of areas where teachers work simultaneously and they don't generally override each other. But, um, it is something we need to take into account sometimes, <laughs> especially with something where there's a lot of collaboration. So a classic example is you've got a whole lot of teachers sitting around a table and they're all trying to edit the same page at the same time. Um, it doesn't happen very regularly, but it can happen and it's just a matter of nominating one person to be lead in that situation. Yep? Question regarding the Victorian curriculum package that you've been talking about. Does it have to be as well? Joanne, can you answer that question? Uh, it currently does not have VCE. Uh, translating the VCE into a curriculum package is actually not that simple. Um, it's, it's unfortunately a very complicated process in trying to convert it across. Um, it's sitting on the top of the priority list there to make that happen. Um, I've been trying to find different approaches over the last 12 months, but yeah, the Australian curriculum kind of came out and that bumped it down, but it is the aim to get it in place. Watch this space. Um, it's the same as Victorian curriculum. Obviously, it announced their timeline for um, the next round of the curriculum. Um, so the aim will be that the maths rolls out ready for term four, and that the rest rolls out ready for 2024. So it'll probably be next year, ready for the 2025 one. So for those that uh, don't understand what the challenge for us is with the curriculum, is that the government likes to put the curriculum in word documents. Um, <laughs> And we like to use it for mapping and, and other purposes other than just having a Word document of it. So we have to extract it from all of those Word documents, um, code it, um, create a structure and a hierarchy so that we can do progressions and a whole lot of really interesting things with the data. Um, and that takes a lot of effort and time to translate from those documents into, into a, what we call a machine readable format. Um, and we have to do that with each curriculum and every revision and. Um, so there's a fair amount of work involved in that process, but we're sort of tooling up to get better and better at it. Is there then so actually either come as well, or is that just too hard? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, there is. So we've been in negotiations with IB for um, quite a long time now. In fact, our CEO is over there now um, meeting with them. So um, we're hoping to get that um, wrapped up pretty soon. We've actually done a whole lot of work to already build out the curriculum and. Um, we're ready to go as soon as we've got you know their approval. Um, so yes, it's it's a it's a work in progress and, and watch this space. It will be coming very soon. Um, we're very optimistic that we'll have um, that fully represented and populated. And actually, with IB, um, it opens up a whole lot of new opportunities as well because IB is much more content driven, and so um, we'll be looking at what we can leverage and what we can do with that content inside those packages, and, and hopefully deploying things like badges. Um, that represent those things, those will all be coming as packages as well. Um, so there's a whole range of different things that we can do um, with that content. So as soon as we get that endorsement from them, we'll be, we'll be ready to go. Correct. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's, our, that's our target, um, is to make it so that it's a one platform for um, IB schools, that they don't need to have many different platforms. Um, obviously we'll be doing PYP, and MYP and DP, um, and so we're sort of working through all of those and getting them put together. So, yeah. Okay. Um, just wondering with lesson plans, will they have their own component? And will that component 
you be able to toggle it so you can get like tiles you At the moment, they don't have their own component. Um, but the, I mentioned the issues with the course outline component. Um, it's very likely that we're going to reimagine how we present um, lesson plans um, inside the, the class. Um, we recognise that we want to make it as easy for students to know what the current lesson is and what's the upcoming lesson and what's the past lesson and that sort of thing. So we're probably going to reimagine um, in, in a special component like you, you sort of mentioned. Um, at the moment, I think it's, it's going to be overwhelming <laughs> because it's going to show... I, I should mention that lesson plans do have a published date, so they don't become visible until the teacher publishes them, but there could be challenges with how many um, appear, so we'll be working through those issues over the next sort of release um, to make sure that we've got some good visualisations that make it easier to track what's going on with the lessons. Yep. And we've heard that the possibility of sequencing or prerequisites in terms of how your lesson plan, you could sequence assessments or like one of three prerequisites. Yeah, so yeah, we do, we have. Um, not actually in the context of um, lessons and assessments, although I mentioned that we're likely to link activities to lessons, which will make them somewhat dependencies of that lesson. Um, they won't be hard dependencies, and we made that decision um, to... Originally, we were thinking well, lesson plans would work like projects, in that activities would sit within the lesson. We've actually gone away from that idea of thinking, and we loosely link them to the lesson so that a, an activity can exist over multiple lessons so they're not dependent on a particular lesson. Um, so we've changed that thinking. Um, we are looking at dependencies in terms of badges as well. Um, so we will likely look at badge dependencies so that you know there'll be levels of badges and you have to have one level before you can get the next level and things like that. So badges will likely have dependencies. Assessments not so much. I haven't thought about dependencies. But there is the, the question that always comes up um, is assessments um, being used to award badges automatically. So do X, Y, Z assessment, get badge. Um, so that might be sort of the dependency that you can imagine that you would do these things and you get this achievement um, unlocked. So there's a few things like that we can start to look at in the future. Yeah. 